Collecting weapons can be one of the most enjoyable parts of any Final Fantasy playthrough, and when it comes to weapon collecting, there is nothing quite like the thrill of hunting down those rare and elusive best-in-class ultimate weapons hidden throughout each game. Often granted as the reward for defeating a super boss or completing a particularly involved side quest, these weapons can provide numerous benefits, from huge stat boosts, access to rare and powerful abilities, additional status effects, or even conditional mechanics that push their strength even further. No matter the acquisition method though, these weapons almost always require a great deal of effort and dedication on behalf of the player. But in this video, we are only going to focus on those ultimate weapons that could be considered a little infamous for the grind required to obtain them. That being said, you can be sure that these weapons still prove to be well worth the work involved. So let's dive right into 7 more of the hardest ultimate weapons to obtain in Final Fantasy, with the usual caveat that we are only going to be featuring one weapon per game, and we're going to kick things off with the most deadly sports ball in the history of Final Fantasy, World Champion. But before we do, a quick note. A few weeks ago, we ran a survey around Final Fantasy XVI, but following the announcement of the release date and the new Revenge trailer, we felt that survey was made a bit redundant. To ensure that effort isn't being wasted, we're rerunning the survey with almost identical questions. The hope is that it will provide more relevant answers and an interesting snapshot as to how trailers can help to sway popular opinion. If you could spare a few minutes, there's a link in the description below. Final Fantasy X is notorious for taking the ultimate weapon motif a bit too far, as the celestial weapons are some of the trickiest ultimate weapons to obtain across the entire franchise. We've put the spotlight on a few of these in the past, such as Tidus's Calabog and Lulu's Onion Knight, both of which require dexterity, patience and strokes of luck. But what separated World Champion out from those two other ultimate weapons was the combination of luck and time commitment. Like the other Celestial weapons, the World Champion became available after receiving the Celestial Mirror, but there was also a further requirement. The player had to have won at least 5 Blitzball matches, or come at least 3rd in a Blitzball tournament. Once fulfilling these requirements, the base weapon itself could be acquired from the cafe owner in Luca, but a little more work and Blitzballing would be needed before the player could use the weapon as it was meant to be used. This was because to reach its full potential, the World Champion needed both the Jupiter Crest and Sigil. The Jupiter Crest could be obtained from the Besaid Oryx's locker room at any time following the first Blitzball tournament in Luca, but obtaining the Jupiter Sigil was a little more involved. To acquire the Sigil, the player would first need to win both a Blitzball tournament and a Blitzball league. This would see Walker's attack reels and status reels limit breaks granted as a reward. Following this, a further tournament would need to be won in order to acquire the Auric Reels limit break. After all that, it would then be possible to win the Jupiter Sigil with a final first place league win, but even then the chance of doing so was only 50%. Some RNG manipulation could be used to make the Jupiter Sigil a little easier to win, but it didn't change the fact that a huge amount of Blitzball would need to be played in order to accomplish the task and that included the time spent recruiting and developing a winning team. It's one of the reasons that the mere mention of Blitzball can send a shiver down the spine, but it should be stressed that upgrading the world champion was a worthwhile endeavour. Not only could it break the damage limit, it also had triple overdrive, double AP and evade and counter abilities. But the process gave Waka access to the most powerful limit breaks, useful tools if the Dark Aeons and Penance were going to be attempted. Now, as mentioned, most of the ultimate weapons in Final Fantasy were rewards for long side quests or defeating optional dungeons and boss encounters, but Final Fantasy VIII did something a little different, and had its ultimate weapons, along with every other weapon in the game, obtainable through crafting. By finding magazines scattered throughout the world, the player would gain insight into the different weapons available and also which items were needed for their assembly at a junk shop. Interestingly though, these magazines were not required to actually craft the weapons. The player only needed the right combination of materials for the option to create the weapon to appear, a fact that also rang true for ultimate weapons. Finding these items was a completely different story though, as they would usually require access to late game enemies and areas. 
but through some clever means, certain weapons could be obtainable a little earlier, if players were willing to put the time in. And that brings us on to the next weapon on our list, the Lionheart. The Lionheart was Squall's ultimate gunblade, and its ingredients were revealed in the first issue of Weapons Monthly. In order to craft this legendary weapon, the player would need to find 1 adamantine, 4 dragon fangs, 12 pulse ammo, and have 2000 gil. Adamantine was dropped by Adamant Toys, but it could also be refined from the Minotaur card. Dragon fangs were dropped from dragon themed enemies like Blue Dragons, Grendels, and the T Rexor. To get the pulse ammo, Ifrit's ammo refinability was required, alongside energy crystals, which were able to be farmed from the Elnoil enemy around Esther. These items could prove tricky to accumulate even in their end game, but the real challenge came in finding them as early as possible, because doing so required mastery of Final Fantasy VIII's signature minigame, Triple Triad. Through Triple Triad, the player could battle, collect, and convert enemies into valuable cards from the start of the game. They could then be used to challenge NPCs and slowly build a better and better collection of cards that could then be refined into the Lionheart's components with the GF ability Card Refine. Doing so would take a considerable time investment, but it meant it would be possible to obtain Lionheart even as early as Delling City. After doing so, Squall would gain access to his ultimate limit break, Lionheart, incredibly early. It would strike a single target 17 times, dealing up to a quarter of a million damage under perfect conditions. Standard attacks would also gain a considerable damage boost, and such early acquisition would see Squall make mincemeat out of some of the game's toughest enemies, regardless of their level. As a series, Final Fantasy has had its fair share of weird ultimate weapons. These include megaphones, dolls, and even sporting equipment, but Final Fantasy IX was the first time cutlery had ever featured, all thanks to Queena. And of all the forks featured in Final Fantasy IX, none matched the might of the Gastro Fork. Obtaining the Gastro Fork was a curious task, as it wasn't hard, at least in the traditional sense. But like many entries on this list, it required a great deal of time and effort on behalf of the player due to its connection with the frog catching minigame that was found at the various Q marshes around the world. At these marshes, the player could attempt to catch frogs as Queena for rewards. The issue was that to actually complete the frog catching minigame, the player needed to catch 99 frogs. And the catch was that they could only catch up to 8 frogs per attempt. In addition, time would then need to be left in between attempts so the frogs could respawn, with the exact amount of time needed being influenced by not only the number of frogs left behind, if any, but also the literal time spent outside of Ku's Marsh. To top it all off, immediately upon catching 99 frogs, players would then be tasked with one more challenge, defeating Queen's gourmand master, Quail. Final Fantasy IX definitely boasted some tough bosses, and Quail featured more HP than any other enemy in the game. Quail could also absorb water magic and cast a variety of status magic such as Poison, Darkness, Confuse, Silence, and Mini, making this a real war of attrition. For their effort in defeating Quail, the player would be rewarded with the Gastro Fork, which had an attack stat of 77 and taught the High Tide ability. Unfortunately though, because of the way the Fork weapon class calculated damage, the Gastro Fork was actually one of the least consistent ultimate weapons in terms of damage in the entire game. To make up for this, the Gastro Fork also had the ability to inflict the stop status effect on enemies when coupled with the added effect ability, but it would ultimately end up being remembered more for the effort it took to acquire than its effectiveness in combat. Many of the best in class weapons in Final Fantasy XII had acquisition methods that were quite tedious, with previous videos covering the Tornasol and the Sightingrat. Continuing on this trend though, is the Danjuro. In the original release of the game, the Danjuro was the ultimate dagger, but in the Zodiac Age remaster it was replaced with the Mina, which served as an upgraded weapon. But the acquisition method for both weapons was basically identical. Like many prized treasures in Final Fantasy XII, the Danjuro was a rare drop from an even rarer enemy, the elusive Larvae Eater. Found inside the Great Crystal, the Larvae Eater was a tough enemy to fight, not because it was hard to defeat, but because it was extremely hard to find. Historically a tricky enemy for players to figure out the spawning mechanics, it wasn't until the release of the Zodiac Age Ultimania that fans had any concrete insight into how to get the enemy to actually spawn reliably. 
it was revealed that in order to get the Larva Eater to appear, the player needed to defeat 256 enemies in the same zone without using a waystone during the chain. This chain would also need to take place at a few specific waystones, and after achieving the correct milestone, the Larva Eater would then have a chance of spawning after the next 30 to 255 kills. Once the Larva Eater was found and then defeated, there was still only a 3% chance of the Danduro dropping, with the Mina having a slightly better 5% chance. If the player did manage to get their hands on one however, they would be in possession of an extremely deadly weapon, as both the Danduro and Mina had extremely low charge times and high attack stats. In addition, the Mina had a 70% chance of adding instant death to its attacks. Both of these weapons were excellent additions to anyone running character builds that utilised daggers in Final Fantasy XII, but due to the hunt required to obtain them, it would be upon the player to decide if the extra bit of firepower was really worth the effort. Weapons in Final Fantasy Tactics Advance were the primary way for players to learn offensive abilities, and as such, were worth more to the player than just their attack stat. Sometimes though, a high attack stat was all that was really needed from a weapon, especially for endgame characters fully equipped with all the powerful abilities, and when it came to Tactics Advance, few weapons outclassed the might of the sequence and the Sapere Ord. Similar to the World Champion, attaining the actual weapons themselves was not the issue, with both weapons obtained in similar ways by completing either the Battle or Mage Tawny missions following the events of Story Mission 20. Upon acquisition however, it would become clear that these weapons did not quite live up to their legendary descriptions. In order to power the weapons up and make them into some of the best equipment in the game, the player would need to do one of two methods multiple times. The first was to re-clear either the battle or maze tawny missions, and the second was to complete multiplayer team-up missions in either co-op or counter co-op modes through the use of the Game Boy Advance's link cable. Successfully doing either of these methods, after having already acquired the weapons, would then raise the magic or attack stats of the corresponding weapon by one point. It sounds easy enough, save for the fact that these weapons started with 32 weapon attack and 5 magic power respectively. This meant leveling them up to their maximum stats of 255 required hours and hours of re-clearing the same missions over and over again. While it is true no other weapons in Tactics Advance could match the sheer power of these two weapons at their best, it is ultimately a little hard to say whether or not undergoing their unique slog of grind was worth it to max them out. While the Royal Arms were front and centre of Final Fantasy XV's lore and story progression, these powerful weapons were not the only worthwhile armaments available to the player as they explored Aeos. In fact, Final Fantasy XV had a variety of other rare weapons that not only Noctis, but also other members of his party could use to increase their battle effectiveness, and chief amongst the dagger class was the Zwill Crossblade. Available in Chapter 15, the Zwill Crossblades were obtained from the Wondrous Weapon side quest, which saw the player hunting and defeating increasingly devilish foes in return for some of the most powerful armaments in the game and as his world crossblades were the final reward for the side quest, they required the player to beat the strongest of these enemies, the Nagelfar. Located in the Clane region of Aeos, the Nagelfar was a deathclaw type demon enemy and a veritable super boss, seeing as it was level 120, had nearly 900,000 HP and boasted a resistance to all weapon attacks. Due to this, it was recommended the player be at least level 99 before even attempting to take it down. If the player did decide to take the Nagelfar on, they would find that foregoing direct physical confrontation and relying instead on potent magic combinations would be the quickest path to victory, as the Nagelfar was weak to magic. If feeling particularly lucky, it could even be poisoned if the correct ingredients were added when combining spells, which could help to chip away at its massive HP pool while the player avoided its attacks. Defeating Nagelfar would prove no easy task, but the Zwill Crossblades were more than worth it boasting a stat of 345 attack, they also increased max MP by 5, the magic stat by 25, dealt an additional 80% damage when the player was at full health, and had an extremely high damage per second rate when compared to other weapons. As Final Fantasy XV featured a variety of weapons to suit a plethora of playstyles, the Zwill Crossplays may not have been to everyone's liking, but it's hard to deny that they were one of the best if not the best endgame weapon the player could find when looking at sheer damage output. And that brings us to the final entry on our list for today, the resistance weapons from Final Fantasy XIV. The idea of an ultimate weapon in Final Fantasy XIV 
is quite nebulous, as the best gear in each class is constantly changing with each new patch and expansion to the main game. Due to this, the resistance weapons were not necessarily ultimate weapons in terms of stats, but seeing as they were the level 80 relic weapons for the Shadowbringers expansion, we thought they fit the series tradition of an ultimate weapon in their own way. So without further ado, let's break them down. Available to the player after completing the main scenario of Shadowbringers and the Ivalice Alliance raids, the Resistance Weapons quest required players to complete a multitude of optional side content and re-clear older content again and again throughout the whole process. Chief amongst this side content was the Bajan Southern Front and Zadnor instanced encounters, which consisted of large open areas loaded with content for players to engage with. In addition, there were also three dungeon-like areas that would need to be cleared. All of these pieces of content would prove essential, as the player would need to farm large quantities of a variety of items in order to progress the questline. As many steps in this process could be hindered by daily or weekly caps alongside good old RNG, this process could take quite some time. And due to their post-expansion patch rollout, the original process could have lasted the best part of a year, but even now it can still take a few weeks or even months. Luckily, there are two points of the resistance weapon questline that, once hit, ensure that the player will not need to redo the grind up until that point, should they wish to repeat the process for other classes. While this greatly reduces the amount of effort and time required in future attempts, the player still has to go through the whole process at least once, making acquiring even one of these trophy ultimate weapons an act of dedication. And with that, I think we're done. They were seven more of the hardest ultimate weapons to obtain in Final Fantasy, but I'm sure there are still a few we forgot. So let us know in the comments below if you feel there are any we missed out, but also we'd love to hear which you found to be the most difficult to obtain. Also, if you enjoyed the video, please give us a like and be sure to subscribe to the channel. All right, everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Galsin, Dikujata, Gregory, and Lord of Morning, who are super special Onion Knight supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.